January 8, 1815. As dawn breaks over the swampy bayous south of New Orleans, a thick mist slowly rises, revealing two armies arrayed for combat on a grassy field. In row upon row of brilliant red, 5,000 British troops stand ready, bayonets gleaming in the early morning sunlight. In front of them, shielded behind an earthen breastwork, a motley collection of 3,500 American frontiersmen, army regulars, sharpshooters, blacks, militiamen, and pirates are poised to meet the onslaught. Standing ramrod straight in the center of the American line, General Andrew Jackson of Tennessee calmly surveys his troops. Affectionately dubbed Old Hickory by his men for his courage and tenacity, Jackson knows that he has done all he can to prepare for this moment. He and his men are ready. Suddenly, rocket streak skyward signaling the British advance. The magnificent sight of the superbly disciplined ranks of redcoats marching toward them draws a lusty cheer from the Americans. Then, as the British come nearer, Jackson's line erupts in a withering torrent of fire. As a regimental band strikes up Yankee Doodle in the background, Andrew Jackson's booming voice rises above the din in a single command. Give it to them, my boys. Let us finish the business today. A British officer later said it was the most destructive barrage he'd ever seen unleashed on a single formation of men. Barely two hours later, it is all over. The British have lost more than 2,000 of their finest soldiers. American casualties are 13 dead, 39 wounded. As Jackson walks down the American line congratulating his troops on their stunning victory, his army erupts again this time in a deafening cheer for their beloved general. It is the greatest feat of American arms up to that time, proving to the world that the fledgling republic has the strength to defend its hard-won freedom against the most powerful nation in Europe. It ended European um, claims that the transfer of Louisiana, which uh, Jefferson had acquired, was illegal. And I think you can make a case that it uh, altered the Spanish and later Mexican positions concerning Texas annexation. So um, you can make the argument that the result of the victory at the Battle of New Orleans really opened the American West. And I think if, the, if Jackson had lost the battle, uh, American expansion might have ended at the Mississippi. Old Hickory instantly gains a new nickname, the Hero of New Orleans, becoming an authentic military hero. America's first since George Washington. But Andrew Jackson is destined to achieve far more than personal glory on the muddy battlefield of New Orleans. As his career continues to soar, he will preside over a revolution in the national psyche as profound as the one which had created the nation itself. He will leave his stamp on an era. Historians will call it the Age of Jackson. Some people today might say that we shouldn't call an age the age of Jackson because no one person can really sum up everything about an age and that, that's obviously true but there is a way in which Jackson stood for an important change in our history and one that we are still trying to understand one that is still important to many people and he stands for that change because he was a figure of conflict he was a figure that was popular with immense numbers of new voters and voters in the West and voters who very much saw themselves as in opposition to an old order. It, it may be hard for us to think of presidents before him as being symbols of an old order that needed to be overturned, but many of the people who supported Jackson felt that way, and Jackson saw himself as a person who was bringing the government to the level of the people and representing them as their tribune, and I think that's what we mean when we call him a great president. Andrew Jackson was born in March 1767 in the Waxhaw settlement along the Carolina border. Shortly before his birth, his father, for whom he was named, died suddenly while clearing land on the family's wilderness farm. Taught to read at a nearby Presbyterian church, it was reported that Andrew took his place among the settlement's few public readers to read newspapers aloud to the generally illiterate community. 
Among the news items read by the nine-year-old was the Declaration of Independence. When fighting in the Revolution claimed the life of an older brother, 13-year-old Andy Jackson and his other brother, Robert, volunteered with William Davies' Backwoods Cavalry as mounted messengers. Captured by the British, an officer ordered Andy to clean his boots. When Jackson refused, the officer slashed him with his saber, scarring the boy's head and hands for life. He then threw Andy and his brother into jail. Before his mother could redeem them, both boys had caught smallpox. Within weeks, Robert was dead. After nursing Andrew back to health, his mother volunteered to tend other desperately ill prisoners held on British prison ships in Charleston Harbor. She caught cholera and died soon afterward. At 15, Andrew Jackson was an orphan with a lifelong hatred of all things British. He never forgot uh, the British. Now there are times in his life where he really hates the Dons more, as he calls the Spanish, because they're blocking up all that wonderful expansion to the Southwest. Uh, but the British stay uppermost in his mind. By Christmas of 1784, Jackson had apprenticed himself to a lawyer in the village of Salisbury, North Carolina. Years later, Jackson would be remembered as the most roaring, rollicking, game-cocking, card-playing, mischievous fellow that ever lived in Salisbury. He once invited two local prostitutes to the town's Christmas ball as a joke. Few were amused. And he did a lot of things that showed uh, he was not always in control. On the other hand, by the time he got to the White House, a good many people have confirmed that this was a vehicle of his. Uh, he was really well under control, uh, but would make it appear that he was not in order to get what he wanted. Uh, so he, he, he's both. He is a good rational man of the 18th century and admires this kind of behavior. In his younger years, he couldn't always keep it buttoned in. Admitted to the bar, Jackson rode circuit in the Carolina Hill Country, riding into East Tennessee on a fine horse and leading another, carrying a slave girl, law books, tobacco, whiskey, and playing cards. A few years later, Jackson crossed the Smoky Mountains, passed through Cherokee territory, and arrived at the recently established village of Nashville. Both as a prosecutor and lawyer for hire, Jackson was sometimes paid in produce, livestock, and land. By the time he was 22, it was said he'd acquired enough land to make a county. And he had taken a fancy to a vivacious 21-year-old named Rachel Robards. Rachel, a superb dancer who, like many frontier women, would later smoke a pipe, had abandoned her first husband, Louis Robards, an insanely jealous Kentucky man. Jackson and Rachel were married in the summer of 1791. With Jackson's flourishing legal practice supplemented by an appointment as U.S. Attorney General for the territory south of the River Ohio, the happy young couple were soon among the most prominent in Tennessee. But their idyllic marriage was shattered when the Jacksons learned that Rachel's first husband had not legally divorced her. Now, two years later, Louis Robards was suing Rachel for divorce on the grounds that she was living in adultery with another man. Technically, Rachel was guilty of bigamy. As soon as the Robards' divorce was finalized, Jackson married Rachel again. But the charge of adultery would continue to haunt their lives and provoke Jackson to assault anyone foolish enough to insult his beloved wife. When Tennessee Governor John Sevier, his tongue loosened by the heat of a political battle with Jackson, remarked that the greatest public service Jackson had ever performed was taking a trip to Natchez with another man's wife, Jackson went wild. Pistols were drawn and shots were fired. Fortunately, the two were separated before a melee broke out. But far more dangerous was Jackson's duel with Charles Dickinson. Dickinson was reportedly the best marksman in Tennessee, able to place four shots in a silver dollar at 24 feet. After arguing over the results of a horse race, they met on a field in Kentucky just over the state line. Standing 24 feet apart, pistols at their sides, on the command, Dickinson fired. Jackson clutched his chest, but didn't fall. The bullet had been deflected from his heart by a rib. Dickinson remained on the line, staring at the ground. Jackson cocked his pistol, took careful aim, and pulled the trigger. But his weapon misfired. 
That might have settled the matter, but Jackson refused to let Dickinson withdraw. He reprimed his pistol and tried again. This time, Dickinson fell mortally wounded and died the next day. Well, of course, Jackson took a bullet in the chest, and um, it was still there to the day of his death. There was no way to remove it. It, is, um, it was his punishment, of course, uh, for the foolishness of this duel. An argument over another duel resulted in a gunfight with Thomas Hart Benton, then a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. Benton was unharmed, but a bullet from his pistol remained lodged in Jackson's arm for 20 years. When a surgeon finally removed it, some suggested it be returned to its rightful owner. Benton, by then a prominent senator from Missouri and one of President Jackson's most ardent supporters, declined on the grounds that 20 years possession made the bullet Jackson's rightful property. Benton enjoyed reminding people that he had once shot the president, adding that back then, no man could claim to be in fashion who hadn't fought at least one duel with Andrew Jackson. As a judge riding the Tennessee circuit, some said Jackson tended to make snap judgments based more on common sense than legal precedent. But no single case did more for his growing reputation than that of Russell Bean. Bean spent a year in New Orleans away from his wife and children. When he returned, he found his wife nursing an infant not of his own making. Bean sliced off the infant's ear to, in his words, distinguish it from his other brats. Bean was arrested, branded on the hand, and thrown into jail. He escaped the Jonesboro jail while Jackson was in town to preside at court. Armed with a pistol and knife, Bean threatened to kill anyone who tried to bring him in. When no one dared, including the sheriff, Jackson picked up a pistol, marched into the street, and pushed through the crowd to Bean. Leveling his gaze at the man, Jackson roared. Now surrender, you infernal villain, or I'll blow you through. Bean surrendered meekly. When asked why he'd given up, Bean replied. When Jackson come up, I looked him in the eye, and I saw shoot, and there wasn't shooting nary another eye in the crowd. So I says to myself, says I, Hoss, it's about time to sing small. And so I did. The Russell Bean affair is one of those stories that turns up in many of the old biographies of Jackson, chiefly as a statement of character and reputation. You can't confirm it, but it does make Jackson look like a tough judge, a man who will see that justice is done, even if you have to step outside the normal proceedings. As one of the territory's leading young men, Jackson was invited to serve as one of 55 delegates to the 1796 State Constitutional Convention in Knoxville. When Tennessee was admitted to the Union, the new state legislature named 29-year-old Andrew Jackson as its first representative to the United States Congress. It took him 42 days to make the 800-mile ride to Philadelphia, which was then the nation's capital. Jackson had barely taken his seat in the House when George Washington presented his farewell address. Most were moved by it, but not Jackson. When the speech was submitted to the House for approval, Congressman Jackson refused to endorse it. It was reported that he wasn't opposed to the content of the document, but found its tone to be, in his opinion, insulting in a country where monarchy had been abolished. The younger Jackson in, in, in his earlier Tennessee days was not someone who uh, admired Washington uh, in, inordinately, and, and in, in fact, the, the party of Washington he saw as a party of aristos, as aristocrats, and uh, even when he went to Congress, he uh, was one of a small number of, of Republican uh, congressmen who had uh, no interest in seeing great honor paid to Washington even at his retirement. But later on, as, as he became a national political figure, and perhaps because the charge was made so often that he had no qualifications for the presidency compared to other people who were running, that, uh, I mean, who, who was he after all? Well, he was a military man like Washington, and uh, uh, he was perfectly willing, and, and, and I think it came himself to, to feel very happy about comparisons that might be made between him and Washington. The War of 1812 began as an American reaction to Britain's so-called Orders in Council, which blocked American shipping, impressed American sailors into the British Navy, and generally insulted American pride. But it was a war that many felt never should have been fought. 
The council's orders had actually been repealed two days before the American Congress declared war. The British savaged America's Atlantic seaports and burned its new half-finished capital in Washington City. A new national anthem was inspired by Francis Scott Key's poem, describing the British shelling of Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. An overwhelming British force threatened the city of New Orleans and control of the Mississippi, the American West's lifeline. With the Americans being humiliated on so many fronts, Andrew Jackson, who previously had been elected the commander of his state's militia, was appointed in May of 1814 to take charge of U.S. forces in the region. He proved to be such a tough commander that his men took to calling him Old Hickory. On the morning of December 2nd, 1814, General Jackson and two staff officers rode into New Orleans. Jackson announced, I have come to protect the city. I will drive our enemies into the sea or perish in the effort. Jackson insisted that black free men of color, who had been organized into militia but never mobilized, be mustered and ordered the paymaster to pay the black soldiers the same as the whites. He also enlisted the aid of a band of pirates who were based nearby, led by Jean Lafitte. By mid-December, crack British troops had moved within 40 miles of the panic-stricken city. Jackson declared martial law and did everything in his power to inspire confidence. By late December, the British had discovered a water and land route through the devilish bayous and emerged on high ground within eight miles of the city. For four days, Jackson put his soldiers to work widening and deepening the Rodriguez Canal, an irrigation ditch that cut across the British line of advance, using the excavated muck to build a low wall. By Christmas morning, the wall was over a quarter mile long, eight feet high, and 12 feet thick, the moat at its base filled with murky water of imperceptible depth. As both sides prepared for a decisive battle, British reinforcements poured in. Dawn, January 8th. Through thick fog, rockets flashed skyward. Over 5,000 British infantry were on the move with bayonets fixed. The Americans waited for Jackson to give the word. When he did, the entire American line erupted. By afternoon, Jackson agreed to a truce. British sergeants, surveying their dead and wounded in the field, noted that many had been shot in the forehead. The backcountry riflemen had done their work with grisly precision. One British soldier reportedly had two such wounds, one above each eye. One of the items that's very significant about the Battle of New Orleans was the fact that uh, uh, Jackson faced uh, the best British regulars. These were, this were, these were the same soldiers who had defeated Napoleon. And uh, we need to remember that prior to this battle, uh, Americans had never won a major victory over a European power without the help of another European power. Even the Battle of Yorktown was uh, made possible by the French Navy. So um, uh, America really had never demonstrated to European powers that it could, uh, could stand on its own. And I think Jackson's victory and the overwhelming dimensions of the victory made it clear to all European powers, not just the English, that we were a major force to reckon with. In an age when it still took a month for news to arrive from Europe, no one in New Orleans could possibly have known that a British-American peace accord had been signed in Ghent, Belgium, two weeks before the battle. But to a people starved for good news, Jackson's victory electrified the nation and made Jackson a national hero. A congressional medal was voted for General Jackson. Against overwhelming odds, the rough-hewn men of the American frontier defeated the same army that had just defeated Napoleon. War with Britain was barely over when a new crisis erupted. Alarmed by the influx of white settlers, renegade Seminole Indians had taken up arms and raided U.S. territory from their lands in Spanish Florida. The War Department ordered Jackson to chase the Seminoles back into Florida while doing his best to respect Spanish sovereignty. Jackson brutally defeated the natives and seized Florida. His success swelled his popularity while creating an international incident for President Monroe. Jackson's critics, among them Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky, wanted Jackson arrested for insubordination. When someone suggested that Monroe get rid of his troublesome and increasingly popular general by sending him to Russia as the American envoy, Monroe's friend, Thomas Jefferson, advised against it. Good God, the alarmed ex-president said. He'll breed you a quarrel before he's been there a month. <laughs> 
when Spain agreed to cede all claims on Florida to the United States for five million dollars, Monroe appointed Jackson as Florida's territorial governor. As John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, John Calhoun of South Carolina, and Henry Clay of Kentucky jockeyed for position in the 1824 presidential race, Jackson backed efforts by his supporters to further his own candidacy. When the electoral votes were counted, Jackson led the field with 99 votes. But since no candidate had a majority of electoral votes, the election would have to be decided in the House of Representatives. Henry Clay of Kentucky was speaker. Now out of the running, Clay struck a deal with Adams. Though not one of Kentucky's electors had voted for Adams, Clay would deliver Kentucky's electoral votes to Adams if Adams would name Clay as his Secretary of State. When Adams won on the House's first ballot, Jackson's supporters cried foul. To them and to millions of citizens, the so-called corrupt bargain was proof that the federal government was being run for the benefit of the few at the expense of the many. It's not clear today that there was precisely the kind of deal that Jackson and, and the, the so-called friends of Jackson, his, his political uh, uh, supporters, called the corrupt bargain. Uh, that is, some people would ask today, what, what else could Clay have done? And, and given who the other uh, candidates were, and given Clay's relationship to Crawford or Clay's relationship to Jackson, I don't think he needed a promise of the, of the position of, of Secretary of State in order to do what he did. And he was, in some ways, a logical candidate for that, uh, that position. But the Jackson people made it seem like a bargain, a selling out of the people's uh, feelings. The election of 1828 was one of the nastiest presidential races in American history. With a campaign slogan of Jackson and Reform, Jackson vowed that if elected, he would eliminate the national debt and end corruption. The struggle was couched in terms of the people versus the special interests. With the Hunters of Kentucky as his campaign song, Jackson was presented as a revolutionary veteran whose heart still beat with the pure virtues of the old Republican ideals. The scar on Jackson's forehead from a British saber was a badge of honor. But having made the election a referendum on virtue, Jackson's opponents did everything they could to defile his integrity. His fights, his duels, cockfighting, horse racing, his high-handed actions in Florida, his questionable marriage to Rachel, a woman who was technically already married, were all catalogued and exaggerated for effect. Unfounded charges and countercharges flew. John Quincy Adams' surprising success as an envoy to Russia was explained with the fantastic story that he had given the Tsar an American girl as a sex slave in return for a diplomatic agreement. Jackson's mother was falsely depicted as a common prostitute brought to America by British soldiers. His father, a part black mulatto. Rachel Jackson was treated to special abuse by the adversarial press. But despite the vicious slanders, Jackson emerged as the clear favorite with 56% of the popular vote. The common people of America had spoken clearly. They considered Old Hickory to be one of their own. What was different with, with Jackson is that he made a very strong case against caucuses, congressional caucuses, choosing the president. That, that he made an issue of the fact that he had received more popular votes in 1824 than Adams, who actually was, was named president in the Congress, had received. He, he made a case that the people's will should be reflected more clearly in the choice of, of president than had been ca the case before. Congratulatory letters and well-wishers inundated the hermitage, Jackson's plantation home in Tennessee. But Rachel, still reeling from the cruel slanders of the campaign, suddenly collapsed of what might have been a heart attack. Rachel Jackson died on December 22, 1828, at the age of 61. Jackson refused to believe that she was dead. He insisted that the doctors continue to bleed her, then spent a long night at her side praying she would revive. Finally forced to accept the fact of her death, Jackson was speechless with grief. On December 24th at 1 p.m., with 10,000 mourners thronging the Hermitage grounds and every bell in Nashville tolling,
The president-elect laid his beloved Rachel to rest in a grave less than 300 feet from the house. For years, he was inconsolable. He prayed for the grace to forgive those who had maligned his wife. But Jackson could never forget. He would avenge himself on the corrupt politicians whom he believed had killed Rachel with their slanders, and he would do it with the full powers of the presidency. She didn't want to go to Washington anyhow. Uh, she'd been there twice and didn't like anything about it. Uh, from the very beginning, they intended to take Andrew Jackson Donaldson, a nephew, and uh, his wife, Emily, uh, to serve as the official host and hostess in the White House. Uh, Rachel looked upon her role as, as small. She didn't want to go. The whole thing had been a misery for her. Certainly, the slanders, which were widely published, uh, caused her no end of grief. There is a poignant letter to her friend in Washington talking about the arrows dipped in wormwood uh, that have been aimed at her. Despite his anger and grief, however, Jackson was determined that his inauguration should be a celebration for the average citizens of America. The event drew tens of thousands to the Capitol. A newspaper editor from Kentucky called it a proud day for the people. Others compared it to the barbarians invading Rome. At the inaugural party, Old Guard Easterners looked on in horror as a mob swept through the doors and windows of the White House, climbing furniture in muddy boots, busting china, spilling whiskey, and spitting tobacco juice on the carpets. They came from miles and miles away. Uh, they camped out for days uh, just to see Jackson. Uh, this is the first really successful popular selling uh, of a presidential image, that he is your president, not their president. So it was a wild party, uh, so wild that Jackson had to get out of there. Uh, his friends uh, backed him out of one of the French doors, and they fled back to the hotel. Many saw the scene as being symbolic of what Jackson intended to do to the business-as-usual attitude in Washington. He filled his cabinet with men from all wings of his party and surrounded himself with a kitchen cabinet of informal advisors. His most controversial appointment was that of John Eaton as War Secretary. Eaton, a close friend and senator from Tennessee, was tainted with scandal. A widower, Eaton was known to be living with a notorious woman named Peggy Timberlake, the beautiful and flirtatious daughter of a Washington innkeeper. Peggy's late teens had featured numerous suitors, two near elopements, the attempted suicide of a lovesick old man, and a duel between rivals for her affections. She finally married a young Virginia man named John Timberlake. When he died a few years later, it was rumored that he had committed suicide. Nevertheless, Eaton married Peggy, but the women of Washington refused to accept her. Swearing that he would never abandon his old friend Eaton, Jackson announced, I did not come here to make a cabinet for the ladies of this place, but for the nation. Still seething over the unavenged slanders against his own wife, Jackson became Peggy Eaton's champion. Mrs. Eaton is as chaste as those who attempt to slander her. After convening several meetings where Peggy's accusers and defenders presented their arguments, Jackson was convinced that she had been totally vindicated. He really liked women without ever bringing any scandal uh, down on himself about other women. He liked their company, and Peggy Eaton was among those he liked. Uh, so he would defend her. But it also produced very nice political results uh, for him that such a to-do uh, over a petticoat uh, would result in recasting the, the uh, cabinet and getting rid of John C. Calhoun for the last time. But tensions had now increased between Jackson and his vice president, Calhoun. Jackson was deeply disturbed by noises coming out of the South, complaining that the federal government consistently favored the interests of northern manufacturers over those of southern planters. Southern political theorists developed a doctrine called nullification, and the chief of the nullifiers was John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Calhoun and his followers argued that each state could decide for itself if a federal law applied. They claimed a constitutional right for states to veto federal legislation, and if its wishes were ignored, a state had the right to withdraw from the Union. 
the nullifiers and the government collided over two issues. Removal of the Cherokee people from Georgia and the tariff. The Cherokee had created their own well-regulated sovereign state. They believed they were protected by treaty with the United States. But the state of Georgia refused to recognize Cherokee sovereignty or federal authority for the treaties and challenged Cherokee ownership of the land. The Cherokee appealed to the Supreme Court, which ruled in its favor. But Georgia refused to recognize the Marshall Court's authority. When asked to enforce the ruling, President Jackson, the ex-Indian fighter, reportedly said, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Though Jackson would not enforce the ruling, neither would he recognize the legitimacy of Georgia's claim. As a way out of the impasse, Jackson pushed for the voluntary removal of all native peoples from the southeast to lands west of the Mississippi. During his presidency, he signed over 90 treaties with various tribes, promising them western lands and eternal sovereignty if they would only leave their homes. But there was a fist of steel inside Jackson's velvet glove. Those tribes that resisted were driven out by the United States Army. Most Americans found the policy rational and humane and praised Jackson for so skillfully dealing with the so-called Indian question. And I think he looked back to 200 years of history um, saying that Indians had been uh, basically exterminated uh, for 200 years when they came into conflict with whites. And his practical solution was uh, two things. Either Indians could individually choose to, to accept a piece of land and, and adopt white ways and become farmers, or if they wished to maintain their culture, they could be moved further west. And, those were the conditions of most of his treaties. They were the conditions that became the basis of his Indian removal policy when he became president. So I think that we, while I don't think we would condone his actions given what we know about what happened afterwards, I think his intentions were probably uh, more sympathetic to Native Americans than we generally credit him with. Far more troubling to most Americans were the South Carolina nullifiers who swore that they would resist by force rather than submit to what they call the tariff of abominations, which drastically raised duties on many goods the South imported from overseas. As their righteous rhetoric swelled, the Southerners claimed to be willing to die in defense of their rights. If pushed, they would secede from the Union. At the annual birthday banquet in honor of Thomas Jefferson, an occasion for celebrating states' rights, the first toasts were predictable. But then Robert Hayne toasted the union of the states and the sovereignty of the states. Calhoun shifted in his seat as Jackson rose. With his eyes locked on the chief of the nullifiers, Jackson proclaimed, A federal union, it must be preserved. To which Calhoun responded, The union, next to our liberty most dear. A few days later, when asked by a congressman from South Carolina if the president had any message to convey to his Carolina friends, Jackson told him, If a single drop of blood shall be shed there in opposition to the laws of the United States, I will hang the first man I can lay my hand on, upon the first tree I can reach. On November 24, 1832, the undeterred Carolina legislature passed an ordinance of nullification by a vote of 136 to 26 and threatened to secede. Jackson promptly ordered all federal forts in South Carolina reinforced and put the Navy on alert. Calhoun resigned as vice president. Jackson then told Carolina's representatives that he was prepared to send 50,000 federalized militia into their state to enforce the Constitution. When the nullifiers let it be known that they might comply with federal law if an adjustment could be made in the tariff, Jackson agreed to a compromise the tariff was reduced and South Carolina annulled its ordinance of nullification. The crisis which had brought the nation to the brink had passed. But the conflict between the North and the South, which it had aggravated, would fester for 30 years before exploding into a bloody civil war. The important fact, I think, is that, that Jackson did stand strongly for the Union. He stood for a, a scaled-down central government, perhaps, but there is no connection between him and a state's rights tradition that would permit um, states easily to withdraw from the Union. In his first inaugural, Jackson had reduced the awesome task of reform to the simple idea of turning the rascals out. 
the deal-making of the 1820s, highlighted by the 1824 election, and the activities of the Bank of the United States, which had been accused of helping to trigger an economic panic in 1819, convinced Jackson that the entrenched federal bureaucracy was riddled with corrupt officials who saw their jobs as permanent and personally profitable possessions. Jackson established the principle of rotation in office as his way of bringing new faces into the government, replacing bureaucrats with men from his own party whom he believed would be more responsive to the needs of the people. While historians have accused Jackson of instituting a spoil system, he actually removed only about 10% of the federal office holders. But of all the things which Jackson believed threatened the life of the Republic, none loomed larger than the Bank of the United States. The brainchild of Alexander Hamilton, the second bank of the United States was a privately owned quasi-monopoly in which the United States Treasury deposited public funds. The United States was a stockholder in the bank but drew no interest on its deposits. Nicholas Biddle, the bank's aristocratic and dictatorial president, claimed that his bank was every bit the federal government's equal and he had warned successive administrations not to interfere. The controversy over banking went back to uh, Hamilton. It went back, in fact, to England. It went back into English history, pre-revolutionary -pre English history. There were many Americans who felt that a central bank was an agency of corruption. It was an association of the federal government with a very narrow economic class that, that, uh, that it hurt all kinds of people all through the society. With the bank's charter up for renewal and Andrew Jackson up for re-election, Biddle urged Henry Clay, who had just announced his own candidacy, to introduce legislation for rechartering the bank. Jackson vetoed it. The political gauntlet had been thrown. Jackson made the Bank of the United States the issue of his 1832 campaign. His opponents characterized him as a tyrannical usurper of power. But for nearly 55% of the voters, Jackson represented democracy, a proven politician with the interests of the people at heart. Strengthened by his re-election, Jackson renewed his assault on the bank by making his ally, Roger Taney of Maryland, Secretary of the Treasury. Taney announced that the government would no longer deposit its revenues in the Bank of the United States. Biddle countered by squeezing the money supply, raising interest rates, and calling in loans. As deflation set in, panic loomed. As the nation suffered, Biddle pointed to Jackson as the cause of its pain. When hordes of businessmen complained, Jackson turned a deaf ear and told them, Go to Nicholas Biddle, he has all the money. I will not bow to the golden calf. Jackson was willing to let the nation suffer deep depression if it wrecked the bank. Biddle was willing to let the economy collapse to save it. The mood of the country grew so violent, Martin Van Buren wore pistols when he presided over the Senate. Jackson himself received hundreds of death threats. Then, on a cold, foggy morning in late January, 1835, a disgruntled office seeker fired two pistols at Jackson at close range. Both misfired. Jackson's escape was deemed miraculous. As Jackson's health declined, those closest to him felt that the only thing keeping him alive was the fight. Old wounds, especially the bullet in his chest from Charles Dickinson's pistol, brought excruciating pain and repeated hemorrhages. Whenever he felt particularly weak, Jackson would have himself bled or alone he would open his own vein. Finally, pushed to the wall by his former allies, Biddle dramatically expanded the money supply. Jackson was right. Biddle did have the money. The panic was over. For all intents and purposes, the Bank of the United States was dead. Jackson had prevailed. When asked about the greatest achievement of his presidency, Jackson replied, defeat of the bank. When asked if he had any regrets, Jackson had only two. That he hadn't hung John C. Calhoun and that he'd never beaten Haney's Mariah, the fastest racehorse in Tennessee. Jackson's presidency, I think, was the fulfillment of the promise in the, uh, in the Constitution about a government by the people. Um, he was the first president elected west of the uh, Alleghenies. He was the first uh, self-made man to be elected president. He was actually the first president who wasn't born and raised in either Massachusetts or Virginia. Actually, he did a lot to the presidency. He turned it into more of a modern institution than any of them had before. 
it had been looked upon as secondary to the legislature in terms of creating policy. Uh, but Jackson had ideas about things he wanted enacted, and he pushed for them. And, uh, of course, was the first president to recognize that the only link with the people of the country as a whole is really the president, uh, not the Congress, not the Supreme Court. Seventy-year-old ex-president Andrew Jackson returned to his beloved hermitage in Tennessee with $90 in his pocket. The estate was deeply in debt. But by year's end, Jackson had managed to pay off $7,000 in bills. Still, he was forced to borrow money from friends to survive. Life itself was a struggle. Each hemorrhage from his old wounds left him weaker. He was increasingly crippled by dropsy, diarrhea, and blinding headaches. Yet he continued to be remarkably active. But one bit of news brightened the old man's retirement. In 1841, the last branch of the Bank of the United States failed, and Nicholas Biddle, financially ruined, had been forced into retirement. Preparing for his own death, Jackson took a walk every afternoon to Rachel's grave. As word spread that Jackson was dying, visitors descended on the hermitage for one final glimpse of their hero. One of his last visitors was a painter, George Healy, commissioned by King Louis Philippe of France to do a portrait for the Royal Gallery. Jackson refused to sit for the portrait until his young daughter-in-law begged him. For her sake, he did. On Sunday, June 8, 1845, ten days after the portrait was completed, Andrew Jackson died. Sometimes we think today that by, by finding out enough about his childhood or finding out enough about his personality that we can explain the, 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 the force that a person like Jackson brought to the presidency and, and to American culture. And I, I think there's a lot that we, that we can't explain about him. As the mourners laid old Hickory's remains to rest beside his beloved Rachel, the silence was broken by a torrent of obscenity streaming from the hermitage porch. Old Paul, Jackson's parrot, shrieked his own farewell. Years later, a visitor to the hermitage asked one of Jackson's servants whether he thought the general was in heaven. The old man replied, If he wants to be, <laughs> <laughs>